Yeah, so we're going to talk about this topic. When do the public condone police violence against a suspected terrorist testing societal acceptance of unconscious bias? So first I'm just going to introduce what we're going to talk about. So we're presenting the rationale and design for a study that we haven't carried out yet, but that we're going to carry out. Um, and at the end, we'd really appreciate your feedback on the design of the study. So please don't feel f uh, afraid about telling us that we're wrong at any point, because we want to sort of learn from this and make sure that what, what, you, what you say we can feed into the design of the study. So the study is a public opinion experiment, meaning that we want ordinary people to go online and complete a survey. And the survey will contain questions about policing terror suspects at a concert venue. So there'll be a vignette, a hypothetical story about um, a terrorist suspect that uh, attends a concert and and we're going to place this, uh, this this story in the context of the Paris terrorist attacks. So we're going to remind people of the Paris terrorist attacks before presenting them with the story. And we're going to use the survey to measure how public attitudes towards policing depend on the information that you present them about policing. Um, so different surveys will present different pieces of information to people about policing. So before we reveal too much about the survey and give the game away, we'd like you to experience what it would be like to take part in this study. So we're going to hand around a short section of the survey and we'd like you to read it and circle your answer to the question at the bottom and then fold the piece of paper up and hand it back. We're not going to like use this, we're not going to yeah. reveal the responses, we just want to do it as an exercise to allow you to realise what it's like to participate in an online experiment. Maybe this is a good time now just to get your yeah, yeah, your yeah. instant reaction to the survey. Um, does it? Yeah, just the questions it raises yeah. and whether it makes any sense and whether it just sounds ridiculous or I interesting or. or uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, so I was actually I didn't realize this, but researchers found that unconscious racial bias is acquired from our genes. That was like news to me. I think. Okay. Oh, the other person <coughs> thinks so that it's acquired from society, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I felt the same. I thought it was like based on like evolution theory and stuff. Like, so, did you believe the explanation that was given? It, it, it is for a gene. It's like based on evolution theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the manipulations um, that you'll see as we go on. But whether it's learned or genetic, mm. um, and so, but that did that seem plausible to you that it would be something that was a genetic sort of trait. I, I have almost no knowledge of like how bodies work. So, I mean, it seems like it, it could be plausible. I was just very surprised by it. That's right. definitely news. If that's true, that's news to me. Right. And yeah. Do you assume that it was learned then? Yeah, I did, I've yeah. assumed it's learned. I mean, obviously I guess there has to be some like material precondition about humans which enable you to learn that kind of thing and then to entrench it in yourself. But I'd have assumed basically it's a learned phenomenon that you dislike people. Right. Think. Well, yeah. like as we go on in oh, yeah. the in the presentation, we talk about like intergroup bias, and so it would be sort of tapping into that, that um, which, which is sort of like an evolu evolutionary adaptation, an intergroup like in group versus out group bias, and so I think we were hoping to tap into that. But I think what we sort of wanted to get from you guys, almost as like in a focus group scenario, was the plausibility of that. Is that something that seems so far fetched, um, or is it something believable if you read that in a vignette? Um, so you also had sort of the same concern that it seemed. Yeah, but I think it's believable. I mean, not every respondents are like thinking about the theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because you're not targeting like scientists. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Or, like, right? Like your your respondents are not right. Just no, the general public. Students or hopefully not students, but probably yeah. the students. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. In my case. Cool. Yeah. Any yeah. other? Mine said that they, um, they learn it from society, which seems plausible. That seems plausible, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm glad that you. Oh, <laughs> yeah. okay. I wouldn't buy the genetic explanation. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I, I mean. You think racism is what goes through the genes? Come on, Bertie. I'm actually very racist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not stupid, though. Don't feel no, stupid. But it's, it's not. It's the most, yeah. it's, a high, it's, a high, it's a supported theory. Yeah, it's been so don't, don't. empirically. It is actually a supported It's a thing, yeah. yeah. So don't, don't. I was also slightly confused by this 30% uh, reduction. I mean, I'm quite intrigued as to how that's calculated. Right. Okay, okay so, so that, the 30% is made up. Right, okay. 
That's so, just to give an example. That's because... A reasonable effect size. Yeah. So there are papers on this. So the, 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 the idea of using brain stimulation to reduce unconscious racial bias, that's not made up. That's a thing. There are papers on it that, and to, to prove that it can, can work. But the 30% is made up because we needed to... Um, in the full survey, you're not just asked about the extent to which you support the use of brain stimulation to correct this problem. You asked about other methods, and we wanted to say that every method is equally effective because we don't effective because we don't want the perceived effectiveness of the method to confound the results. So, yeah. so I mean, the thirty percent is not is not particularly important. We just want to say that it, it works and it works to a to this extent, yeah, 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 yeah. practically and, and important. Re- yeah, 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 it's yeah. not just like a zero point zero 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 one percent reduction. Yeah. Okay. I mean, because at the end of the day, it's hypothetical in the sense that, as far as I'm concerned, in 100 years' time, it's quite likely that, the, the, or I don't know, 100 years' time, as in the future at some point, that, you'd, that you're only going to be able to increase the effectiveness of these measures if that's what society wants to do. If it wants to invest in these measures and increasing their effectiveness, then it, it's completely plausible that you'd be able to increase <coughs> the effectiveness of the measures. So if they're currently... Uh, the effectiveness of reducing bias by 5%, then that should only increase as, as technology yeah. increases. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, okay, so let's continue with the presentation. Um, <clears throat> so, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to talk about um, any more about what unconscious racial bias is because you've all read about that, read about that in the survey. Um, but one thing to stress is that unconscious bias is by no means restricted to the police or the topic of race. There is a strong body of evidence that we are all unconsciously biased towards people who are different to us in a variety of ways. So the question is, um, what can we do about unconscious bias? And as you read in the survey, there are ways of reducing racial bias using new technologies, new ways of enhancing the mind, which in this context means cleaning the mind of racial biases. So this paper here which is a really cool paper, it discusses whether judges in courts should be legally obliged to use cognitive enhancers to free themselves of unconscious racial bias. And that's the bias that has been well established to cause judges to sentence, for example, black offenders to prison for longer purely on the basis of their ethnicity. So there's a large amount of evidence that that's the case and that there's nothing to do with correlates of ethnicity, it's simply to do with ethnicity. so we know that there are means, or that in the future there will be more and more effective means of reducing unconscious bias. Um, and we're interested in whether the measures proposed in that paper also apply to the police, particularly in times of terror threats. Um, and we're interested in whether the police will one day be legally obliged to take cognitive, cognitive enhancers to reduce their unconscious racial bias, especially in contexts where that bias could have huge consequences, such as a police shooting. So there are three key ways of reducing racial bias as proposed in the previous paper. (coughs) The least controversial is virtual reality training. So this involves wearing head-mounted video goggles um, to explore a virtual world, which is specially designed to reduce unconscious racial bias. So in this world, the player takes on the body of an outgroup member um, and so becomes an outgroup member's uh, avatar and interacts with other outgroup characters. By outgroup, we mean uh, if you were defining group membership on the basis of ethnicity, for ethnicity, for example, and you're a white person, then you might interact with a black person or an Asian person or, or somebody of a different ethnicity. So the player moves their um, outgroup avatar by moving their own body, which is detected by sensors, um, or in a less sophisticated setup, you have something like this. Um, so that's kind of the least ethically controversial <coughs> means of reducing unconscious bias. Then there are drugs which decrease the availability of brain chemicals in areas of the brain associated with unconscious racial bias. And this decrease in brain chemicals is designed to reduce the activity of these brain areas to reduce unconscious racial bias. And then finally, there is non invasive brain stimulation, which is what you read about in the survey. Um, Amazingly, unbelievably, slash scarily, the public can already buy brain stimulation kits online to help them play video games better. And this is the website that you see here. 
And we think that one day you will also be able to buy brain stimulation kits to help you make less biased decisions. Um, so those are the sort of three methods in which, the three kind of new methods of the future in which you might be able to um, reduce this unconscious bias. Um, so, yeah, there is, I mean, yes, these methods are quite futuristic, but there is already evidence that, for example, brain stimulation can be used to reduce unconscious racial and gender bias. But we think, so we're not, speci we're not specifically interested in, 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 in the, the question of, of well, in terms of, of adding to this body of literature, we're interested in the big question of whether, or the controversial question of whether society will support the use of these measures. Um, we're asking the question, do people really want to get rid of unconscious bias? We want to get rid of it, but do people really want to get rid of it? Does society at large want to get rid of it? And are people as motivated to get rid of unconscious racism as they are to get rid of conscious racism? Um, <clears throat> because we think that people secretly like unconscious bias because it allows them to be biased without the disadvantages of looking biased. And there is some indirect evidence of this. For example, um, the first study here found that people were more likely to endorse stereotypes after reading that most other people believe stereotypes are true. And the second study here found, just as an example finding, there were several studies within the paper, one example finding was that <coughs> people who were given the opportunity to disagree with a blatantly sexist statement were later more willing to favour a man for a stereotypically male job, suggesting that if you've proven that you're not uh, sort of prejudiced at a conscious and explicit level, you might be more likely to show prejudice in your behaviour or decision making. Um, so the idea here is that people might actually use their lack of conscious racism to sort of justify to themselves being allowed to be unconsciously racist in the same way that if I had <coughs> five bananas for lunch, I might think that it's okay for me to have a cake in the evening or something. Um, this idea of sort of self-licensing. So that's sort of the controversial um, argument. And now I'm going to pass over to Jenna who will look at the reasons why people might secretly sort of like unconscious bias. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Rob talked about in experimental settings why we might secret, secretly like unconscious racial bias, but I think we all are familiar with the real world examples of this. If I think we're all familiar with this loon on the right. Um, and we could probably spend the rest of the seminar debating why he's able to command such electoral salience, um, by, but I and I think many others would suggest it has something to do with tapping into a pervasive racist sentiment in the U.S. Um, and um, this is obviously limit, limited to demagogues, but it has cropped up in seemingly organic forms. You'll notice the map on the right, which is a map of New York City, is almost completely racially segregated um, according to, this is a residential map, sorry, of New York, and it's segregated according to ethnicity. So I think um, red is white, I think, yeah, red is white, um, red is white. Um, blue is Asian, uh, I think, yeah, I'm not exactly sure the colors, but anyway, so um, where was I? And then the pie chart here on the bottom is um, the racial and ethnic makeup of white social networks. So um, white people almost exclusively engage with other white people. Um, and then you can see really small here on the bottom that it's almost completely marginal um, other races. So. Um, well, I think these are just but a few examples. Um, I think they point to a, a systematic patterning of implicit intergroup behaviors. And what we propose here is that they're reflective of a cognitive bias known as ultimate attribution error. Um, and quite simply, ultimate attribution error is an iteration of in-group favoritism and out-group antagonism. It's a tendency to perceive the behavior of an out-group in negative and dispositional terms and in in-group and positive situational terms. Um, so an example might be if you get in a car accident, you're likely to attribute it to the weather, you know, a malfunction of your car, or other such external factors. Whereas if someone else hits your car, you're more inclined to attribute it to their inability to drive or just their you know, affinity for Donald Trump or something like that. Um, so um, a classic example would be you know, a team rivalry. So you know, Cambridge, Oxford, something like that. Um, 
you know, this ridiculous diagram pretty much distills it quite simply. You know, whatever we do is, you know, something angelic. Whatever they do is something, you know, demonic. Um, but the key here is that out group members are held to be more responsible, more deserving, and therefore more suitable targets for violence. Um, this is particularly true under instances of group threat. Um, so what we didn't mention is in this scenario earlier in the vignette, um, the instance of group threat uh, at the concert venue was an Ellie Golden concert. Um, and this we thought this mapped on quite well to an in-group scenario which appealed to students because potentially um, a lot of the, the survey participants will be students like yourself. And we thought, you know, uh, <laughs> Ellie Golding's number one in the, you know, the UK, um, <laughs> you know, Billboard Hot 100, whatever it is. So um, it's something that you very well may attend, um, and therefore it's something that it's the in-group. So um, whenever the in-group is held to be at threat, um, whenever the in-group's held to be at threat, um, there's increases in punitiveness, um, there's uh, increases in dehumanization of the outgroup. There's further outgrouping, um, decrease in guilt for harm doing. Um, in, f in fact, it may not even be considered harm doing. Um, in a study by Wool and Branscum, for example, um, after being reminded of 9-11, Americans reported not only feeling less guilty for harm inflicted on Iraqis, but actually felt feelings of entitlement to inflict harm on them, um, which shirks the whole issue of the fact that Iraq was not behind 9-11. But um, so we suggest these intergroup dynamics and biases may in fact lend support for discriminant policing that in the presence of what is perceived to be a group threat or um, perceived very much being the operative word, people seek more aggressive policing um, against the outgroup, <coughs> more punitive policing. They may have a discrepant image of what legitimate policing even is. Um, so they may find that um, legitimate policing might be know, fair, just treatment for themselves and, um, you know, aggressive, discrepant t tactics towards what they perceive to be the outgroup. Um, and therefore, what may be seen as legitimate may in fact be distributive, distributively and procedurally unjust towards the outgroup, um, such as this image of stop and search. Um, and as Sarah and, um, and her colleagues found, um, white people actually allocate greater discretion to police when it comes to blacks, and they actually want aggressive policing towards the outgroup. Um, so again, turning back over to Rob. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so kind of this leads us on to the final question of when, when people might feel more justified in trying to retain unconscious racial bias. And we think that people feel more justified in maintaining forms of racism that don't appear to be our fault. So specifically, we predict that when people think racial bias is unconscious rather than conscious and inherited rather than learned, people will be more motivated to maintain that bias because we think people see genetic and unconscious behaviours as unchangeable, as not our fault, and as good because we tend to think that natural behaviours, innate behaviours are good, natural behaviours are how the world was meant to be, apparently. <coughs> this, has got, this has got a name in, in psychology, it's called the naturalistic fallacy and there's been a lot of literature and, and studies on this, on, this, on this tendency. So the key manipulation in our experiment is whether racial bias, and by manipulation we mean the thing that we're going to change between the different conditions of the survey, the different versions of the survey that we present to participants. The key manipulation is whether racial bias is described as conscious or unconscious and as genetic or learned. So when we gave you the survey, some of you received a survey that described bias, the bias as learned, and some of you received a survey that described the bias as genetic. And in the real survey, we would do the same on a larger scale and compare the answers that the four groups of the participants give. So does describing bias in these four different ways affect the way in which you view policing, uh, the policing of a, of a terror suspect? So this finally leads us to our main hypothesis, which is that we predict society will condone unconscious bias more than conscious bias and that it will con condone genetic bias more than learned bias. So 
yeah, that's it. That's 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 all the rationale behind the study. Now we just need to get on and do it, yeah. um, and come back and present the data in ten years' time. <laughs> and uh, and um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you for listening. And yeah, we'd love to, any feedback that you have or any questions. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, they're both equally as likely to commit a terrorist offense. All things are equal. The only difference is their ethnic background. Um, mm. One person's mm. an Asian Muslim, the other person's, you know, a, like a, a Christian, a white Christian or something like that. Um, so all things being the same, the one thing that's motivating the, the like stop and search is the fact that the one individual um, is of a diff different yeah. ethnicity. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's um, so we have a, there was, there's another study that one day we want to do, which is where, where instead of manipulating the way in which we describe bias, we want to manipulate the ethnicity of the person who's subject to the bias. So yes, and that's where, that's where you can control for other factors in a kind of hypothetical way and say, well, both of them have got exactly the same objectively calculated links with terrorism. They've got different motives, but both are seen, <coughs> well, it doesn't have to be terrorism, but they're both seen as, as this dangerous, as, as calculated through some risk assessment tool. That, and, and, and you know, the only difference is that one is, is white and the other one is... And Asian. another way of doing it, which we also haven't done, would be instead of it being like an L.A. Golden concert where the, the people who would be under attack would presumably be in-group members, a predominantly white crowd, it would be um, another performing artist who would be a Pakistani artist or something like that. Um, and the majority of the people who would be harmed if a bomb went off, for example, would be predominantly outgroup members or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we would have you value, like, value the um, number of deaths inflicted or something like that. Yeah. Presumably people would um, overestimate the harm inflicted if it was an in-group member and underestimate the harm inflicted if it was an outgroup member. So kind of do we value, what, do, do white people value white lives more than outgroup lives? But that's, I mean, that's just a different study, so right. don't, don't, don't worry. But these are sort of like the iterations of, this is how of like outgroup bias. Yeah. It's, it's operating at an implicit level, but of course, like conscious racism is these sort of like, you know, derogatory remarks and the police station and that kind of stuff. Yeah, whereas nobody would explicitly say, well, yeah, okay, a white life is more worth more than yeah, right. black life. But right. actually, right. if you look at people's practice. decision making, then you can tell that the only reason they could possibly have approved of police violence in one condition more than another was right. because they because the, the crowd the ethnicity of the crowd was right. different therefore right. you must value white lives more I had two more questions that's okay. so first of all I guess uh, I'm worried about what I would call like an epistemological problem where so I think you talk here at some point about like say how much so you think someone's as equally likely as another say to commit a terrorist attack and the only thing that's different is their ethnicity mm. but of course as a police officer you're not going to know that you don't you don't right. know how likely someone is right. and that that's something which you don't have access to so you have to go off certain cues mm. so you may say yes actually and objectively they're equally likely to commit a terrorist um, attack and the only thing different is their ethnicity but for the knowledge that the copper has to make that decision on is is going to be limited and maybe maybe in that sense actually it's okay to racially profile you know, I mean, oh, yeah, 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 right, right. No, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I and mean, certainly, people do argue that. So, but um, I mean, we, so. But maybe that's not actually really relevant. I mean, we are we're looking at. We would say sector. sort of like the implicit cues of danger. Like pe people are like say all things being equal, that you're cued to danger if it's an outgroup member as opposed to an in-group member. That that in and of itself is sort of, um, sort of like an implicit stereotype, yeah, right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. And like a police officer could have the same amount of information about the, the likelihood of this suspect committing an act at this time. So you, the police obviously, you know, plan their missions and, 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 and have a lot of <coughs> expertise and intelligence coming in about the individual. And so they could plausibly be given a risk assessment score for the individual that was exactly the same for an individual with the, of a different ethnicity. Um, and. Well, do they actually okay. get risk assessment scores, or is that a construct you're using to overcome this problem of... Um, in this scenario, it is a construct, but sometimes they do. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's true, we are... I mean, we, we, are we, we try to do it this, Yeah, this is a completely oh, yeah, I mean, right, experimental yeah. setting. Um, but I mean, for, like, for hot spots policing, for example, they'll get, like, they'll, f like, they'll be able to ascertain what are, like, the hot spots, what, what areas have the most, like, they'll get, like, a risk assessment of an area, for example. Oh, but, like, at a much higher level than... Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll like, so people will say, for example, like 50% of crime occurs in like 2% um, of areas. Yeah. So that would be one way of, yeah. yeah. Um, my other question is just about in-group, out-groups, and how confident you are that the in-group is of the coppers is as homogenous, perhaps, as you're suggesting, and whether that could be something you could start to manipulate where, I don't know, so if, 
if the in group of the police was actually like the out group as such, and so if the police yeah. were an ethnic minority, I don't mm. know how that would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good it. right, um, that's so interesting. and that's something that we've I think kind of <coughs> struggled with a bit is how do you even what constitutes an in group or an out group? Um, like race is one proxy for that. It could be like sports teams. It could be you know there's all these other constructs. Um, where I'm from, for example, in New Orleans, uh, cops are major like are majority black, um, but they still sort of um, police pretty discriminately against black people. Um, so I think uh, there is a lot of literature pointing to the fact that um, sort of it's cop culture and that that becomes like the subordinate ident the superordinate identity. Um, yeah, so, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that it becomes like this master identity. So you know, I do, I don't really know. I think we've chosen like race as as our construct for mm. for identity. Um, I mean, it'd be really interesting to look at. Yeah, I but manipulating <coughs> that would be yeah. Yeah, or looking at white white respondents to the survey compared to ethnic minority respondents to the survey. It, do they evaluate? The behavior of a white police officer differently, do, or if you know, does does it does it matter whether the, whether the police officer is a minority group member? Yeah, I mean, right. yeah, it's just and yeah. in different contexts as well, because this is coming from a very like you know Anglophone con context. Um, I think in other contexts it would be completely different. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you touched on that, and I wanted to ask: Do you expect different answers to the survey based on demographics? Yeah, I think so. Um, Yeah. Um, I was thinking when you um, assign people into those like four different groups yeah. for different conditions, maybe you have to consider um, you have very similar distribution in demographics such as age, education, race, uh, ethnicity, because I think that will definitely affect the um, yeah. your acceptance. Absolutely. But if you want, uh, it, I think it depends. I mean, if you want to see. Uh, if if they are if the ethnicity and education if they're like your like independent variables yeah, yeah, you right. shouldn't control them but yeah. if you want to control them yeah right yeah, so, p yeah, so the most important thing is that people would be randomly allocated to one of the four conditions so we should have the same um, variety of people in each condition mm -hmm. but yeah random allocation to each condition is really important otherwise there could be an alternative explanation right. as to why these people say um, show more approval of bias than these people and that's that just we have loads of young right. people here or we just have loads of... Right, because right about... But, but, but do you expect different questions based on demographics because you identify in the survey that the people that the police are targeting are Asian Muslims, right? So do you expect that Asian Muslims answering the survey would answer quite people? differently than white people answering the survey? Yeah. yeah. Because they're the, they're the out group. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Presumably, yeah. yeah. So we, because, so to simplify things, we originally um, kind of envisaged only using the data from the white people that responded to the survey, mm -hmm. just to simplify things. But um, absolutely, it'd be interesting to look at the differences. We haven't thought about exactly what we'd expect in terms of the differences, what the differences would be. I think it would actually be interesting to take several yeah. groups and then see if there's differences yeah, between Yeah, because I imagine because there would be, would, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. That might be an interesting contribution. Yeah, definitely. And I also think that you're not trying to control how people perceive the brain stimulant treatment, right? That's not part of the manipulation. Mm. No, no. So I think the wording of the description of what it is and how it works is crucial. Right. Because when people read that you're going to take cops which are mostly perceived, I think, as relatively good people, and they're going to be stimulating their minds that can scare a lot of people, yeah. and make them negative to this treatment, not because they're, you know, not... Right, but because the treatment them. itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because it sounds but scary. the adverse effects. So mm -hmm. when you put the picture up on the screen of a person who bought it so he can use it in games, mm -hmm. it makes it much more approachable. Oh, right. Okay. So I would definitely say that yeah. this is not... I mean, it's being used in trial. Right. It's being used by individuals who want right. to better their gaming abilities and yeah. it's, you, it can be bought for five pounds on Amazon. Yeah. Um, right. What do you think about if we listed like the side effect, like, you know, the chances of I, getting I a versus side effects? That, that actually might make it scarier. Okay. Because when you start talking about side effects, I start talking about psychiatric, yeah. I think about psychiatric medication. Yeah. 
So, you know, now you can buy this for five pounds on Amazon kind of thing. Yeah, They're yeah, widely yeah. used by the gaming public, yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah I really think that's good. a really good idea. Yeah. Um, and also the way it's phrased currently in the survey, there's this kind of build-up to it. There's this measure, and it reduces by 30%. How would you support this measure? And the measure is brain stimulation. Yeah. So I think I would, no, if you yeah. don't want the wording to influence... Yeah, don't make it so suspenseful kind of exactly. thing. Exactly. Yeah. I would re reduce the suspense and yeah. kind of try to present this in the most... Just like innocuous. ...neutral yeah. possible way. absolutely. And I think that will take a few tries, but I would definitely disseminate the people and ask them, would you undergo, would you use this yeah. device? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think it's really, really, really good, good suggestions. Yeah, um, yeah, but I, and one of the things that we are interested in is whether people could use the fact that it looks like a scary treatment as an a means excuse. of ex excuse yeah, accepting exactly. racist practices in society. Because we actually did want to have like an open-ended question. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, I, I don't know how you could ever. Test. Well, to have an open-ended question and say what are the reasons that you might be opposed to this like mm -hmm. you know there's side effects um, associated with this you know um. yeah but we can we, we I mean we know so the important thing is across all four conditions people if people are going to be scared by I mean I think it's really important that we don't that they don't aren't too scared by the brain stimulation in the first place mm -hmm. but people should be as sort of shocked and scared as the brain stimulation of the brain stimulation device in this condition is this condition is this condition yeah. so any differences that we do find in the acceptability of the use of brain stimulation cannot be attributed to, attributed to differences yeah, in how so scared we are yeah. to the brain stimulation device so we can definitely can establish um, whether people are using the fact that the treatment looks scary as an excuse for accepting right. racism we can right. definitely establish that um, but at the same time, we don't want to scare people to the extent that we reach a ceiling effect of, oh my gosh, this is just too much, right. I'm not going to approve right. it, because then we won't find... So one way to do that might also be to interview some of the respondents. Yeah. About, if you, I think if you interview 25%, I mean, how many people do you want to fill this thing out? Um, yeah. Like 150 per condition, so 600. Benzo, that was too much. Really? Okay. All right, let's pretend cost, it's 400. How cost per survey? Do you have to pay? Or? Yeah, 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 so... If it's so, it depends what you use. But if you um, so, basically, um, it would cost if it's a ten-minute survey, one pound per person. So we can get it a lot cheaper if we use an, an <laughs> like Amazon mechanical. Engineer <laughs> mechanical tool, uh, yeah, 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 which is kind of like oh. That's okay for dark. like initial studies, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like that. For the first study, yeah, it's fine, but then yeah, and there are concepts and you get more cash. You can do it. Yeah, and there are, um, you know, art studies in top journals that use Mechanical Turk. We just can't get our heads around it, the idea of paying. Because you, you really actually choose the price. You could pay like one cent to a participant. And, and they do. But exactly, who's kind of like, who's willing to, you know, take an hour long survey for a cent? You know, it's just a bit. It's an hour long survey? No, 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 well, no, no, like, no, no, yeah, no. It could, no. But this isn't an hour long survey, but, but as in. Mm -hmm. Like it kind of like you wonder what kind of people that attracts. If you read, yeah, you know, yeah. when yeah. you read these papers, they use a mechanical Turk and they pay. They do pay the participants because they can get away with it, like a dollar an hour at the most. And you just and there are loads of papers on mechanical Turk and pros and cons. But and it's usually not a standalone paper. They'll usually pub like you stand like you know five other studies in addition to this one mechanical Turk study. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, um, I don't know. It just seems strange. Mm. We do it a lot here. Last question I wanted to ask was, is racial profiling still a, you know, police policy in any country that we're talking about? Um, I mean, is it still an official policy in the US and the UK? Or does it happen under the table? I mean, I don't think it's, you know, written on the books. Like, you, you know, it's okay to, you know, stop and search black people, you know. Yeah, more than white. But, but I think that... That it happens. Yeah. Evidence that it happens. Right. So you want to look at... Um, where the algorithms are used, which implicitly yeah. racially profile, yeah, like but it's in objective e ways. Even, right, risk assessment tools yeah. like, are notoriously racist despite the fact that they have this like, guise of ob yeah. objectivity, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah, and as soon as... A lot of people research that here. So right, yeah. yeah. I mean, well, this so is the funding yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's one form of... Uh, no, I mean, there's indirect discrimination just in the fact that if you target poor areas, Right, that maps on more race. To yeah. live in poor areas. And of course, you know, so there are all these different types of racism, and perhaps you put them on a continuum of severity, but, and then someone, you know, somebody could draw the line and say, well, it's okay to target poor areas. And, you know, people, obviously the police officers do target high crime areas, and probably, and high crime areas 
are correlated with lack of lack of uh, income and therefore with right. minority group members. So, you know, that's accepted. But so what we're trying to take is like the most unacceptable form of racism, which comes back to the idea of like imagine you have two people who, according to all objective standards, right. are equally dangerous or you know in the in the wealth context are equally poor. Um, the only thing that differs is their ethnicity, because we want to kind of step. We don't want to just prove that people are accepting of this in very indirect form of, of racism. We want to talk about it as like proper racism, if that's what if that's what society yeah. believes is proper racism and not proper racism. Um, I guess just one, perhaps one final thing, because I think we're nearly at five to you. Um, the choice to focus on firearms training is that. I mean, is that just because, and obviously, anything involving a gun is very problematic, there's obviously a very big risk of like serious damage being mm. done, but are you fiddling around with that in different... Yeah, we, we, I mean, that that's just an idea that came up originally, we were, we, we were... So one of the problems, one of the criticisms potentially of this entire survey would be that it could come across as too far-fetched, so the idea of police officers receiving the brain stimulation just, um, oh sorry, only firearms trained um, police officers receiving the stimulation, only receiving them before high-risk operations, just increases the plausibility of um, this futuristic uh, scenario, Give, particularly given that as a respondent in this survey, you may well never have heard of unconscious bias, brain stimulation, drugs right. to reduce racism, what is going on? You know, yeah. So we don't want to bombard people to the extent of um, telling them, do you support the use yes, of brain stimulation for every police officer you know, day one of training, then you have to first take a drug, like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just to ease people into the idea rather than, although, you know, it wouldn't be surprising that if in the future, sort of, it was not just, you know, a firearm-specific thing. And it's not, this is something I've made up. It's not something, it's not like somebody's written a paper on the use of brain stimulation for, the, for police officers, even. The only paper that we have is, um, is, is is, is the um, is this one in terms of judges and you know this is this is like breaking, break, cutting edge, yeah, breaking cutting breaking edge, bad. In the, <laughs> breaking bad, <laughs> cutting edge. So uh, it's a rendezvous study. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know. Yeah. No, I think it's interesting. I mean, I think you can maybe make it more apparent that this is like a sort of exceptional circumstance. Well, like okay. you're, you're talking about something which is very unlikely. It's just for the really high risk right, stuff, right. and maybe very niche. yeah, yeah, you know, this isn't going to be widely used. But when, right. they, when things do go wrong in this scenario, obviously they get really wrong. Right, so it's worth so it's not like the rank and file are taking these enhancements, yeah. but yeah, right. yeah. But I mean, yeah. it does come across. It's just maybe explicitness. Um, no, I think that's a really good idea, and yeah. I think it ties back with the previous idea about. You can buy this for five pound off Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, normalizing and normalizing right. something outlandish, yeah. right? Because it is just. Yeah. It is a very sort of like, whoa, mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of idea. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah go ahead. Yeah. No, it's great. No, 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 no bring it on, bring it on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. First of all, it's like one has a comment. I think if you're like worried of like having fear, like by scenario or like suggestion, uh, I think <coughs> this can be like money. It doesn't have to be like random, like you don't have to randomly uh, choose respondent for manipulation so you just can ask your like bunch of your friends and then read each scenario and then check how fearful like you felt. And then if they're like similar in each scenario, I think it won't be like problematic at all. And um, I was, my question was, I was wondering how license effect would be related to this study, I think the... Yeah, yeah actually it. that's something yeah. that I just, <coughs> mentioned to you this morning yeah. so um but i was thinking just in are you are you from psychology I'm, no but i'm definitely with licensing effect what did you do what did you say what did you say i said i'm not from psychology but, but i'm personally familiar she, with she's familiar with oh you're familiar with yeah 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 so yeah so i'm not, i don't know much about this but i know that there are studies in health psychology talking about the idea of well, there's a lot of studies in psychology about willpower, and one of the big, so we know that if you use will, 
if you exert willpower, willpower is like a muscle in the sense that if you, if you exert it, um, it then becomes more difficult to exert willpower again immediately afterwards, but, it, but in the long term, if you exert willpower regularly over a long period of time, then it actually builds up just like a muscle. A muscle would be tired just after using it, but in the long term it Strength becomes stronger and stronger. So, um, and people have been trying to explain this, this effect, this sort of um, <coughs> willpower depletion effect for a long time. And um, people used to try and explain it in terms of like actual fatigue and tiredness, blood, blood, even blood glucose levels and stuff like this. And, um, and then, but then some people came along and said, no, it's not about actual ability, it's about motivation. And the fact that if you have um, resisted something a lot at midday, then at 2 p.m. you think, well, you know, I've, I've tried so hard to resist that temptation. It's just so hard, you know, I deserve a break from having to resist. Um, and so the parallel with here is, I'm I've tried so hard not to be racist, I'm now I'm allowed to be racist. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so uh, <laughs> have a kick, have a... It's very interesting, but as far as I understood, there are like two types of explanation why it happens. One is, like you said, we have limited capacity of our moral behavior. So if you did a lot of moral behavior, like you just want to liberate ourselves because we're so tired. Mm. So be a racist because mm. I did something good earlier. I'm so tired. And But the other explanation is my sensing is that it's very temporary stuff. So it's not like very long term, like um, like a behavior. For example, one, uh, one like one's prior experience in moral behavior can activate to one's moral identity such as I'm a very nice person. So it temporarily liberates oneself to engage in immoral yeah, yeah, behavior. Yeah. So I temporarily, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. no definitely. But I think it can be a little bit related to your experiment and but but but, but it's really stretchy. Yeah. But if if it's genetic, if people say like it's right. genetic, maybe it can activate some Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And it will affect their like approval of like morally questionable um, like suggestion. So, I mean, if if it's genetic, they may say like, "Oh, I'm genetically like racist." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can activate a little bit like immoral yeah. self identity, which mm. will actually engage in their approval for moral behavior, although it's kind of harsh. So it's right. This naturalistic fallacy. Yeah, 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 fallacy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But it's totally based on the like you know like theory of the like my moral identity and self identity. Right. So yeah, it's very stretchy, but it can if I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Def it's, it's I mean like logically. I mean logically, like from the theory, I think it's a little contradictory. But yeah, I mean. I well, I think that, I mean, I'd only thought about this parallel this morning, and then, but I think... Just toss it yeah, there. <laughs> fresh from the bed, let's go back. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I, um, what would be interesting, of course, would be to look at the literature on uh, self-licensing and, and, um, and look for the way in which they study it and, and sort of learn from that in terms of how we design our experiment because it's just not a literature that I know much right. about. And it so has been integrated. Yeah, it, I mean, it would never be integrated with something like this. I'm sure it hasn't been integrated with right. something like this. So, you know, hopefully if this, you know, we, we collect data and write the paper, it would be great to have a section just spelling out the relevance of that literature. Right. Because, I mean, this is a big thing that criminology doesn't do but it says it does, which needs to do more is, is establishing uh, links with all sorts of related fields, mm -hmm. and I mean, this is just a small example of that, you know. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys thank so you much. Yeah. The feedback was honestly very helpful. So, thank you.